Coming up today, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in China. He's going to press Beijing to do more to address North Korea's latest nuclear test and calm tensions stemming from the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. Moon Jae-in, chairman of South Korea's main opposition party, has resigned. He's handing the reins to Kim Jong-in, the head of the party's election campaign committee. Plus, setting a record for the most consecutive qualifications, South Korea seals a spot in the men's football tournament at the 2016 Rio Olympics. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Wednesday, the 27th of January. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start at the nation's top office. President Park Geun-hye is likely to embark on her first visit to Iran soon to become the first South Korean president to do so. In his daily briefing, presidential spokesperson Jong Yong Guk told reporters that the trip is currently under review and further details will be released when finalized. If confirmed, President Park will likely discuss ways to bolster economic cooperation following the lifting of international sanctions on Tehran. The North Korean nuclear issue would almost certainly be on the table as well. President Park has cited Iran as a glowing example of a country giving up its nuclear ambitions and being welcomed back into the international community. South Korea's Foreign Minister Yim byung se visited Tehran in November of last year. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is in China to discuss sanctions on North Korea following the regime's nuclear test early this month. Kerry is also set to have discussions on the increasingly tense maritime disputes in the South China Sea. Connie Kim has the details. Two issues top John Kerry's agenda in China. First is getting Beijing to join the rest of the world in slapping heavy sanctions on North Korea for its latest nuclear test. Kerry arrived in the Chinese capital late Tuesday after wrapping up his short stay in Cambodia. He'll meet Chinese officials on Wednesday to discuss the U.S.-led U.N. Security Council resolution that's being drafted against Pyongyang. Washington is pushing for bans on North Korean oil exports, mineral imports and a tightening of financial sanctions on Pyongyang. Whether Kerry is successful in getting Beijing to change its stance is another matter. China, a veto-wielding permanent member of the UN Security Council, does not want to sanction its longtime ally so heavily. Beijing's foreign ministry has laid some of the blame at Washington's door, too, saying the U.S. could have done more to restart the six-party denuclearization talks that have sat dormant for more than seven years. The process of denuclearization has met difficulties in these years, and the six-party talks were suspended due mainly to the failure in this respect on the part of some individual parties. We hope they could, together with China, put the peninsula's nuclear issue back on the right track as soon as possible, rather than making indiscreet remarks or criticisms. Another key issue for Kerry is urging Beijing to decrease tensions over disputed parts of the South China Sea. Kerry is expected to call on China to stop constructing artificial islands and airstrips in disputed waters. His trip to China follows meetings with the leaders of Laos and Cambodia, where Kerry called for unity from Southeast Asian nations in the face of Beijing's territorial claims. Kerry and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi are scheduled to hold a joint press conference in Beijing on Wednesday afternoon. Connie Kim, Arirang News. South Korea and its allies have condemned North Korea for destabilizing regional security and undermining international non-proliferation efforts. During a session at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, Kim Jong-moo, who is Seoul's deputy ambassador to the UN, said Pyongyang's latest nuclear test was clearly against the moral obligation of the conference. He added that South Korea will fully cooperate with the international community to impose comprehensive sanctions against North Korea. Now, North Korea's ambassador to the UN, So Se Pyong, said the purpose of the regime's nuclear development was to counter threats posed by, North, uh, by the United States. Rather, He also claimed it was North Korea's own right as a sovereign country to conduct nuclear tests. 
Fourteen members of the conference, including the US and Japan, urged North Korea to immediately renounce its nuclear weapons program. Now, the embattled leader of the main opposition, Minju Party of Korea, has formally stepped down after months of internal strife and an exodus of members from the party's ranks. Moon Jae-in has named his successor, who will lead the party in April's general election. Shin Se-min reports. Moon Jae-in has formally resigned as chair of the main opposition Minju Party of Korea, following up on a promise he made earlier this month. I am relieved to be resigning at a time when there is new hope within the party, thanks to new innovations and new recruits. He added that he will now help with the preparations for an upcoming parliamentary election scheduled for April 13th. In announcing his resignation, Moon also named his successor. Kim Jong-in, who currently chairs the party's election committee, is a political strategist who once served on a ruling party's election committee. He will now lead the party into the elections. Kim sang the former head of the party's reform committee, will take over Moon's position as leader of the party's membership recruitment arm. Moon had been under a great deal of pressure to resign following a leadership dispute with former party co-chair An Cheol Su. An has since left the party, prompting several others to follow in his footsteps. Moon is expected to start working on the party's membership recruitment drive after a short break in his hometown in Yangsan, Gyeongsangnam-do province. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, South Korea has confirmed a spot in the men's football tournament at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. It makes the South Korean team the only country to qualify for eight consecutive Olympics. Park Se-young has more on the game that sealed the squad's ticket to Brazil. South Korea took the victory, beating Qatar 3-1 in Doha on Tuesday night in the semifinal of the Asian Football Confederation Under-23 Championship. The tournament doubles as a qualification event for the Olympics with the top three teams heading to Brazil. This carries the team into their eighth consecutive Olympic men's football tournament. No other nation has qualified for eight Olympics in a row. South Korea took the lead with Ryu sung scoring the first goal in the second half, but the teams remained level at 1-1 until the 89th minute. The winning goal was scored by Kwon chang Un in the dying seconds, and it was followed quickly by another from Moon Chang-jin right before the final whistle. With tickets to Rio in hand, South Korea will face Japan in Saturday's final, also in the Qatari capital. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, in economic news, Korea's consumer sentiment worsened to its lowest level in six months in January, further stoking concerns of a drastic fall in domestic spending early this year. Our economics correspondent, Hwang Jie, has the details. Faced with plunging oil prices and the slowdown in China, Korea's consumer sentiment continued on its downward trend this month. The Bank of Korea's Consumer Sentiment Index came in at 100 in January, down two points from the previous month. The figure marks the lowest level since July last year, right after the MERS outbreak took a toll on the economy. The outbreak peaked in June, causing the index to slump to 98, but government-led sale events jump-started spending in the third quarter, helping it reach 105 in November. But with those measures losing steam early this year and the figure on a downslide again, concerns are lingering over a drastic drop in spending. Given such worries, the government has pledged to front-load its budget spending in the first three months of this year while introducing new promotional events around the Lunar New Year holiday, one of Korea's biggest national holidays that falls in early February this year. But experts say most of the focus should be on the country's household debt. With government measures, there won't be a sudden drop in consumption. But to maintain a stable improvement in spending, the government has to work on lowering household debt so it does not put excessive strain on daily expenses. The monthly index reflects the overall economic outlook of consumers, their living conditions and future spending plans. A reading over 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. Hwang Jie, Arirang News.
Now, the U.S. Federal Reserve is widely expected to take a wait-and-see approach to rates at this week's meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. The committee will announce its decision in Washington on Wednesday afternoon local time. But the general consensus is that rates will remain unchanged at 0.25% to 0.5%. Analysts also say the Fed is unlikely at this point to give any clear hints about the likely outcome of its next big meeting in March. That month, in fact, had been flagged as the most likely time for another hike. However, analysts say rising concerns about China, the renewed plunge in oil prices and the increasing probability of a sharp slowdown in U.S. GDP growth in the fourth quarter have dampened that possibility. And the World Bank has slashed its forecast for oil prices by roughly one third this year amid growing supply and slowing demand in emerging markets. In its annual commodity markets outlook, the World Bank cut its price outlook for crude oil to an average of 37 US dollars a barrel for 2016, down from a projection of $51 in October of last year. The bank's economists say they expect a gradual recovery in oil prices over the course of this year after plummeting by 47% in 2015, but added that the rebound will be smaller than in previous years that uh, followed sharp declines. Prices for 37 of the 46 commodities monitored by the World Bank were also revised lower for the year. The bank will update its commodity outlook in April. It's the undisputed jewel in Apple's crown. But iPhone sales are starting to falter. Apple says it sold around 74.8 million iPhones in the fiscal first quarter that ended on December 26th. But that does fall short of analysts' estimates and marks, in fact, the quarterly growth of just 0.4%. Uh, and that is by far the slowest since the iPhone's introduction in 2007, Apple's total sales rose 1.7% to 75.9 billion US dollars from a year ago. Net profit, that jumped over 2% to $18.6 billion, making, uh, marking really the most profitable quarter in corporate history, period. However, the slowdown in iPhone sales, which account for about two thirds of Apple's revenue, is raising some serious doubts about Apple's growth down the line. The company forecasts that sales in the current quarter will decline for the first time in over a decade. Now, more than two thirds of the world's 50 richest people are self made, while the other third inherited their wealth. This is according to the US based online economic news site Business Insider. Now, among the heirs and heiresses in the world's richest uh, uh, woman, that is Alice Walton. She is the daughter of late Walmart founder Sam Walton and the Koch brothers of the multinational corporation that bears their name. The rest of the people on the list built their fortunes like that gentleman there, Bill Gates of Microsoft and Amancio Ortega, who founded the clothing giant Zara. 29 of the 50 are Americans and nearly a quarter maintained or built their wealth in IT. Now, North Korea suffers from dry winters and temperatures that drop well below freezing for months and months on end during the winter. The country relies heavily on hydropower and uh, this means that electricity is especially in short supply during the cold winter months. And when there is a power shortage, the effect on Pyongyang is much more severe than in cities outside of the capital. Our Son Jung in explains why. A foreigner who lives in Pyongyang posted a picture and a message on social media recently when the country was hit by severe winter weather. The picture was one of a weather forecast for the coming weekend that said the mercury will plummet to minus 20 degrees Celsius in the capital city. The message read, I hope that winter will end soon because we really need electricity and water. Most overseas residents in Pyongyang live under relatively good conditions, but even they cannot escape the electric power shortage in the north. Unlike other provincial cities that still use traditional underfloor heating systems fueled by firewood, the capital relies on electric power for most homes and commercial buildings. But it is often unreliable. In Pyongyang, 
They use hot water from thermoelectric power plants to heat apartments. But in a severe winter, the hot water pipes often freeze and rooms go unheated. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, who has focused on power generation to help modernize the economy, called on citizens to save energy during his New Year's speech this year. A fight to increase electricity production and save energy is the most noble act of patriotism. However, North Korea is on the verge of becoming even more isolated from the international community following its fourth nuclear test. That is expected to result in tougher economic sanctions, which is expected to bring the regime food shortages and prolonged poverty. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now on this Wednesday lunchtime here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you ever so much for tuning in to our news bulletins. We really appreciate it. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. Until then, goodbye.